The People of the Black Circle by Robert E. Howard Part 3 Chapter 9 The Castle of the Wizards The sun had risen over the white Himalayan peaks. At the foot of a long slope a group of horsemen halted and stared upward. High above them a stone tower poised on the pitch of the mountainside. Beyond and above that gleamed the walls of a great keep, near the line where the snow began that kept Yimsha's pinnacle. There was a touch of unreality about the whole purple slopes pitching up to that fantastic castle, toy-like with distance, and above it the white glistening peak shouldering the cold blue. We'll leave the horses here, grunted Conan. That treacherous slope is safer for a man on foot. Besides, they're done. He swung down from the black stallion, which stood with wide braced legs and drooping head. They had pushed hard throughout the night, gnawing at scraps from saddlebags and pausing only to give the horses the rests they had to have. That first tower is held by the acolytes of the Black Seers, said Conan, or so men say, watch dogs for their masters, lesser sorcerers. They once sit sucking their thumbs as we climb this slope. Karim Shah glanced up the mountain, then back the way they had come. They were already far up Yimsha's side and a vast expanse of lesser peaks and crags spread out beneath them. Among these labyrinths the Turanians sought in vain for a movement of color that would betray men. Evidently the pursuing of coolies had lost their chief's trail in the night. Let us go then. They tied the weary horses in a clump of tamarisk and without further comment turned up the slope. There was no cover. It was a naked incline strewn with boulders not big enough to conceal a man, but they did conceal something else. The party had not gone fifty steps when a snarling shape burst from behind a rock. It was one of the gaunt savage dogs that infested the hill villages and its eyes glared redly, its jaws dripped foam. Conan was leading, but it did not attack him. It dashed past him and leaped at Karim Shah. The Turanian leaped aside and the great dog flung itself upon the Irakzai behind him. The man yelled and threw up his arm, which was torn by the brute's fangs as it bore him backward, and the next instant half a dozen tulvars were hacking at the beast. Yet not until it was literally dismembered did the hideous creature cease its efforts to seize and rend its attackers. Karim Shah bound up the wounded warrior's gashed arm, looked at him narrowly and then turned away without a word. He rejoined Conan and they renewed the climb in silence. Presently Karim Shah said, Strange to find a village dog in this place. There is no offal here, grunted Conan. Both turned their heads to glance back at the wounded warrior toiling after them among his companions. Sweat glistened on his dark face and his lips were drawn back from his teeth in a grimace of pain. Then both looked again at the stone tower squatting above them. A slumberous quiet lay over the uplands. The tower showed no sign of life nor did the strange pyramidal structure beyond it. But the men who toiled upward went with the tenseness of men walking on the edge of a crater. Karim Shah had unslung the powerful Turanian bow that killed at five hundred paces, and the Iraqzai looked to their own lighter and less lethal bows. But they were not within bowshot of the tower when something shot down out of the sky without warning. It passed so close to Conan that he felt the wind of rushing wings, 
but it was an Iraqzai who staggered and fell, blood jetting from a severe jugular. A hawk with wings like burnished steel shot up again, blood dripping from the scimitar beak to reel against the sky as Karim Shah's bowstring twanged. It dropped like a plummet, but no man saw where it struck the earth. Conan bent over the victim of the attack, but the man was already dead. No one spoke, useless to comment on the fact that never before had a hawk been known to swoop on a man. Red rage began to be with fatalistic lethargy in the wild souls of the Iraqzai. Hairy fingers knocked arrows and men glared vengefully at the tower whose very silence mocked them. But the next attack came swiftly. They all saw it, a white puff pole of smoke that tumbled over the tower rim and came drifting and rolling down the slope towards them. Others followed it. They seemed harmless, mere woolly globes of cloudy foam. But Conan stepped aside to avoid contact with the first. Behind him, one of the Iraqzai reached out and thrust his sword into the unstable mass. Instantly, a sharp report shook the mountainside. There was a burst of blinding flame, and then the puffball had vanished, and the two curious warrior remained only a heap of charred and blackened bones. The crisp hand still gripped the ivory sword hilt, but the blade was gone, melted and destroyed by that awful heat. Yet men standing almost within reach of the victim had not suffered except to be dazzled and half blinded by the sudden flare. Still touches it off, grunted Conan. Look out, here they come. The slope above them was almost covered by the billowing spheres. Karim Shah bent his bow and sent a shaft into the mass, and those touched by the arrow burst like bubbles in the spurting flame. His men followed his example, and for the next few minutes it was as if a thunderstorm raged on the mountain slope, with bolts of lightning striking and bursting in showers of flame. When the barrage ceased, only a few arrows were left in the quivers of the archers. They pushed on grimly over soil charred and blackened, where the naked rock had in places been turned to lava by the explosion of those diabolical bombs. Now they were almost within arrow flight of the silent tower and they spread their line, nerves taut, ready for any horror that might descend upon them. On the tower appeared a single figure, lifting a ten-foot bronze horn. Its strident bellow roared out across the echoing slopes like the blare of trumpets on Judgment Day, and it began to be fearfully answered. The ground trembled under the feet of the invaders, the rumblings and grindings welled up from the subterranean depths. The Iraqzai screamed, reeling like drunken men on the shuddering slope, and Conan, eyes glaring, charged recklessly up the incline, knife in hand, straight at the door that showed in the tower wall. Above him, the great horn roared and bellowed in brutish mockery, and then Karim Shah drew a shaft to his ear and loosed. Only a Turanian could have made that shot. The bellowing of the horn ceased suddenly, and a high, thin scream shrilled in its place. The green-robed figure on the tower staggered, clutching at the long shaft which quivered in its bosom and then pitched across the parapet. The great horn tumbled upon the battlement and hung precariously, and another robed figure rushed to seize it, shrieking in horror. Again the Turanian bow twanged, and again it was answered by a death howl. The second acolyte 
in falling, struck the horn with his elbow and knocked it clattering over the parapet to shatter on the rocks far below. At such headlong speed had Conan covered the ground that before the clattering echoes of that fall had died away, he was hacking at the door. Worn by his savage instinct, he gave back suddenly as a tide of molten lead splashed down from above. But the next instant he was back again, attacking the panels with redoubled fury. He was galvanized by the fact that his enemies had resorted to earthly weapons. The sorcery of the acolytes was limited. Their necromantic resources might well be exhausted. Karim Shah was hurrying up the slope, his hill men behind him in a straggling crescent. They loosed as they ran, their arrows splintering against the walls or arching over the parapet. The heavy teak portal gave way beneath the Cimmerian's assault and he peered inside warily, expecting anything. He was looking into a circular chamber from which a stair wound upward. On the opposite side of the chamber a door gaped open, revealing the outer slope and the backs of half a dozen green-robed figures in full retreat. Conan yelled, took a step into the tower and then native caution jerked him back, just as a great block of stone fell crashing to the floor where his foot had been an instant before. Shouting to his followers, he raced around the tower. The acolytes had evacuated their first line of defense. As Conan rounded the tower, he saw their green robes twinkling up the mountain ahead of him. He gave chase, panting with earnest bloodlust, and behind him Karim Shah and the Iraqzai came pelting, the latter yelling like wolves at the flight of their enemies, their fatalism momentarily submerged by temporary triumph. The tower stood on the lower edge of a narrow plateau whose upward slant was barely perceptible. A few hundred yards away this plateau ended abruptly in a chasm which had been invisible further down the mountain. Into this chasm the acolytes apparently leaped without checking their speed. Their pursuers saw the green robes flutter and disappear over the edge. A few moments later, they themselves were standing on the brink of the mighty moat that cut them off from the castle of the Black Seers. It was a sheer walled ravine that extended in either direction as far as they could see, apparently curdling the mountain some 400 yards in width and 500 feet deep and in it, from rim to rim, a strange, translucent mist sparkled and shimmered. Looking down, Conan grunted. Far below him, moving across the glimmering floor which shone like burnished silver, he saw the forms of the green-robed acolytes. Their outline was wavering and indistinct, like figures seen under deep water. They walked in single file, moving toward the opposite wall. Karim Shah knocked an arrow and sent it singing downward, but when it struck the mist that filled the chasm, it seemed to lose momentum and direction, wandering wildly from its course. If they went down, so can we, grunted Conan, while Karim Shah stared after his shaft in amazement. I saw them lost at this spot. Squinting down, he saw something shining like a golden thread across the canyon floor far below. The acolytes seemed to be following this thread, and there suddenly came to him Kemsa's cryptic words, Follow the golden vein. On the brink, under his very hand as he crouched, he found it, a thin vein of sparkling gold running from an outcropping of ore to the edge and down across the silvery floor. 
end he found something else which had before been invisible to him because of the peculiar refraction of the light. The gold vein followed a narrow ramp which slanted down into the ravine, fitted with niches for hand and foothold. Here's where they went down, he grunted to Karim Shah. They are no adepts to waft themselves through the air. We'll follow them. It was at that instant that the man who had been bitten by the mad dog cried out horribly and leaped at Karim Shah, foaming and gnashing his teeth. The Turanian, quick as a cat on his feet, sprang aside and the mad man pitched head first over the brink. The others rushed to the edge and glared after him in amazement. The maniac did not fall plummet-like. He floated slowly down through the rosy haze like a man sinking in deep water. His limbs moved like a man trying to swim, and his features were purple and convulsed beyond the contortions of his madness. Far down at last on the shining floor his body settled and lay still. There's death in that chasm muttered Karim Shah, drawing back from the rosy mist that shimmered almost at his feet. What now, Conan? On, answered the Cimmerian grimly. Those acolytes are human. If the mist doesn't kill them, it won't kill me. He hitched his belt and his hands touched the girdle Kemsa had given him. He scowled, then smiled bleakly. He had forgotten that girdle, yet thrice had death passed him by to strike another victim. The acolytes had reached the farther wall and were moving up it like a great green flies. Letting himself upon the ramp, he descended warily. The rosy cloud leapt about his ankles, ascending as he lowered himself. It reached his knees, his thighs, his waist, his armpits. He felt as one feels a thick, heavy fog on a damp night. With it lapping about his chin, he hesitated and then ducked under. Instantly, his breath ceased. All air was shut off from him and he felt his ribs caving in on his vitals. With a frantic effort, he heaved himself up, fighting for life. His head rose above the surface and he drank air in great gulps. Karim Shah leaned down toward him, spoke to him, but Kone neither heard nor heeded. Stubbornly, his mind fixed on what the dying Kemza had told him, the Cimmerian groped for the gold vein and found that he had moved off it in his descent. Several series of handholds were niched in the ramp. Placing himself directly over the thread, he began climbing down once more. The rosy mist rose about him, engulfed him. Now his head was under, but he was still drinking pure air. Above him, he saw his companions staring down at him, their features blurred by the haze that shimmered over his head. He gestured for them to follow and went down swiftly, without waiting to see whether they complied or not. Karim Shah sheathed his sword without comment and followed, and the Iraqsai, more fearful of being left alone than of the terrors that might lurk below, scrambled after him. Each man clung to the golden thread as they saw the Cimmerian do. Down the slanting ramp they went to the raven floor and moved out across the shining level, treading the gold vein like rope walkers. It was as if they walked along an invisible tunnel through which air circulated freely. They felt death pressing in on them above and on either hand, but it did not touch them. The vein crawled up a similar ramp on the other wall up which the acolytes had disappeared, and up 
It they went with taut nerves, not knowing what might be waiting for them among the jutting spurs of rock that fanged the lip of the precipice. It was the green-robed acolytes who awaited them, with knives in their hands. Perhaps they had reached the limits to which they could retreat. Perhaps the Stygian girdle about Conance's waist could have told why their necromantic spells had proven so weak and so quickly exhausted. Perhaps it was knowledge of death decreed for failure that sent them leaping from among the rocks, eyes glaring and knives glittering, resorting in their desperation to material weapons. There, among the rocky fangs on the precipice lip, was no war of wizard craft. It was a whirl of blades, where real steel bit and real blood spurted, where sinewy arms dealt forthright blows that severed quivering flesh, and men went down to be trodden underfoot as the fight raged over them. One of the Iraqsai bled to death among the rocks, but the acolytes were down slashed and hacked asunder or hurled over the edge to float sluggishly down to the silver floor that shone so far below. Then the conquerors shook blood and sweat from their eyes and looked at one another. Conan and Karim Shah still stood upright and four of the Iraqzai. They stood among the rocky teeth that serrated the precipice brink, and from that spot a path wound up a gentle slope to a broad stair, consisting of half a dozen steps a hundred feet across, cut out of a green jade-like substance. They led up to a broad stage of roofless gallery of the same polished stone, and above it rose Tier upon tier, the castle of the Black Seers. It seemed to have been carved out of the sheer stone of the mountain. The architecture was faultless, but unadorned. The many casements were barred and masked with curtains within. There was no sign of life, friendly or hostile. They went up the path in silence and warily as men treading the lair of a serpent. The Iraqzai were dumb, like men marching to a certain doom. Even Karim Shah was silent. Only Conan seemed unaware what a monstrous dislocating and uprooting of accepted thought and action their invasion constituted. What an unprecedented violation of tradition. He was not of the East, and he came of a breed who fought devils and wizards as promptly and matter-of-factly as they battled human foes. He strode up the shining stairs and across the wide green gallery straight toward a great golden-bound teak door that opened upon it. He cast but a single glance upward at the higher tiers of the great pyramidal structure towering above him. He reached a hand for the bronze prong that jutted like a handle from the door, then checked himself, grinning hardly. The handle was made in the shape of a serpent, head lifted on arched neck, and Conan had a suspicion that that metal head would come to grisly life under his hand. He struck it from the door with one blow, and its bronze clink on the glassy floor did not lessen his caution. He flipped it aside with his knife point and again turned to the door. Utter silence reigned over the towers. Far below them, the mountain slopes fell away into a purple haze of distance. The sun glittered on snow-clad peaks on either hand. High above, a vulture hung like a black dot in the cold blue of the sky. But for it, the men before the gold-bound door were the only evidence of life. Tiny figures on a green jade gallery poised on the dizzy height with that fantastic pile of stone towering above them. 
A sharp wind of the snow slashed them, whipping their tatters about. Conance's long knife splintering through the teak panels roused the startled echoes. Again and again he struck, hewing through polished wood and metal bands alike. Through the sundered ruins he glared into the interior, alert and suspicious as a wolf. He saw a broad chamber, the polished stone walls untapestried, the mosaic floor uncarpeted. Square, polished ebon stools and a stone dais formed the only furnishings. The room was empty of human life. Another door showed in the opposite wall. Leave a man on guard outside, grunted Conan. I'm going in. Karim Shah designated a warrior for that duty and the man fell back toward the middle of the gallery, bow in hand. Conan strode into the castle, followed by the Turanian and the three remaining Iraqzai. The one outside spat, crumbled in his beard and started suddenly as a low mocking laugh reached his ears. He lifted his head and saw on the tier above him a tall, black-robed figure, naked head nodding slightly as he stared down. His whole attitude suggested mockery and malignity. Quick as a flash, the Iraqzai bent his bow and loosed, and the arrow streaked upward to strike full in the black-robed breast. The mocking smile did not alter. The seer plucked out the missile and threw it back at the bowman, not as a weapon is hurled, but with a contemptuous gesture. The Iraqzai dodged, instinctively throwing up his arm. His fingers closed on the revolving shaft. Then he shrieked. In his hand, the wooden shaft suddenly writhed. Its rigid outline became pliant, melting in his grasp. He tried to throw it from him, but it was too late. He held a living serpent in his naked hand, and already it had coiled about his wrist, and its wicked wedge-shaped head darted at his muscular arm. He screamed again, and his eyes became distended, his features purple. He went to his knees, shaken by an awful convulsion, and then lay still. The man inside had wailed at his first cry. Conan took a swift stride toward the open doorway and then halted short, baffled. To the men behind him it seemed that he strained against empty air. But though he could not see nothing, there was a slick, smooth, hard surface under his hands and he knew that a sheath of crystal had been let down in the doorway. Through it he saw the Iraqzai lying motionless on the glassy gallery, an ordinary arrow sticking in his arm. Conan lifted his knife and smote, and the watchers were dumbfounded to see his blow checked apparently in mid-air, with a loud clang of steel that meets an unyielding substance. He wasted no more effort. He knew that not even the legendary Talwar of Amir Kurun could shatter that invisible curtain. In a few words, he explained the matter to Karim Shah, and the Turanian shrugged his shoulders. Well, if our exit is barred, we must find another. In the meanwhile, our way lies forward, does it not? With a grunt, the Cimmerian turned and strode across the chamber to the opposite door, with a feeling of treading on the threshold of doom. As he lifted his knife to shatter the door, it swung silently open, as if of its own accord. He strode into the great hall, flanked with tall glassy columns. A hundred feet from the door began the broad jade green steps of a stair that tapered toward the top like the side of a pyramid. What lay beyond that stair he could not tell. But between him and its shimmering foot stood a curious altar of gleaming black jade. 
four great golden serpents twine their tails about this altar and rear their wedge-shaped heads in the air facing the four quarters of the compass like the enchanted guardians of a fabled treasure but on the altar between the arching necks stood only a crystal globe filled with a cloudy smoke-like substance in which floated four golden pomegranates. The sight stirred some dim recollection in his mind. Then Conan heeded the altar no longer, for on the lower steps of the stair stood four black-robed figures. He had not seen them come. They were simply there, tall, gaunt, their vulture heads nodding in unison, their feet and hands hidden by their flowing garments. One lifted his arm and the sleeve fell away, revealing his hand, and it was not a hand at all. Conan halted in mid-stride, compelled against his will. He had encountered a force differing subtly from Kemsas's mesmerism, and he could not advance, though he felt it in his power to retreat if he wished. His companions had likewise halted, and they seemed even more helpless than he, unable to move in either direction. The seer, whose arm was lifted, beckoned to one of the Iraksai, and the man moved toward him like one in a trance, eyes staring and fixed, blade hanging in lip fingers. As he pushed past Conan, the Cimmerian threw an arm across his breast to arrest him. Conan was so much stronger than the Iraksai that in ordinary circumstances he could have broken his spine between his hands. But now the muscular arm was brushed aside like straw and the Iraksai moved toward the stair, treading jerkily and mechanically. He reached the steps and knelt stiffly, proffering his blade and bending his head. The seer took the sword. It flashed as he swung it up and down. The Iraksai's head tumbled from his shoulders and thudded heavily on the black marble floor. An arch of blood jetted from the severed arteries and the body slumped over and lay with arms spread wide. Again, a malformed hand lifted and beckoned, and another Iraksai stumbled stiffly to his doom. The ghastly drama was reenacted, and another headless form lay beside the first. As the third tribesman clumped his way past Conan to his death, the Cimmerian, his veins bulging in his temples with his efforts to break past the unseen barrier that held him, was suddenly aware of allied forces, unseen but waking into life about him. This realization came without warning, but so powerfully that he could not doubt his instinct. His left hand slid involuntarily under his Bakariot belt and closed on the Stygian girdle. And as he gripped it, he felt new strength flood his numbed limbs. The will to live was a pulsing white-hot fire, matched by the intensity of his burning rage. The third Iraksai was a decapitated corpse, and a hideous finger was lifting again, when Conan felt the bursting of the invisible barrier. A fierce, involuntary cry burst from his lips as he leaped with the explosive suddenness of pent-up ferocity. His left hand gripped the sorceress's girdle as a drowning man grips a floating log, and the long knife was a sheen of light in his right. The men on the steps did not move. They watched calmly, cynically. If they felt surprise, they did not show it. Conan did not allow himself to think what might chance when he came within knife reach of them. 
his blood was pounding in his temples, a mist of crimson swam before his sight. He was afire with the urge to kill, to drive his knife deep into the flesh and bone, and twist the blade in blood and entrails. Another dozen strides would carry him to the steps where the sneering demon stood. He drew his breath deep, his fury rising redly as his charge gathered momentum. He was hurtling past the altar with its golden serpents when, like a leaven flesh, there shot across his mind again as vividly as if spoken in his external ear the cryptic words of Kemsa, Break the crystal ball. His reaction was almost without his own volition. Execution followed impulse so spontaneously that the greatest sorcerer of the age would not have had time to read his mind and prevent his action. Wheeling like a cat from his headlong charge, he brought his knife crashing down upon the crystal. Instantly, the air vibrated with a peal of terror, whether from the stairs, the altar, or the crystal itself, he could not tell. Hisses filled his ears as the golden serpents, suddenly vibrant with hideous life, writhed and smote at him. But he was fired to the speed of a maddened tiger. A whirl of steel sheared through the hideous trunks that waved toward him, and he smote the crystal sphere again and yet again. And the globe burst with a noise like a thunderclap, raining fiery shards on the black marble, and the gold pomegranates, as if released from captivity, shot upward toward the lofty roof and were gone. A mad screaming, bestial and ghastly, was echoing through the great hall. On the steps writhed four black-robed figures, twisting in convulsions, froth dripping from their livid mouths. Then, with one frenzied crescendo of inhuman ululation, they stiffened and lay still, and Corner knew that they were dead. He stared down at the altar and the crystal shards. Four headless golden serpents still coiled about the altar, but no alien life now animated the dully gleaming metal. Karim Shah was rising slowly from his knees, whither he had been dashed by some unseen force. He shook his head to clear the ringing from his ears. Did you hear that crash when you struck? It was as if a thousand crystal panels shattered all over the castle as that glow burst. Were the souls of the wizards imprisoned in those golden bowls? Ha! Huh! Conan wheeled as Karim Shah drew his sword and pointed. Another figure stood at the head of the stair. His robe too was black but of richly embroidered velvet, and there was a velvet cap on his head. His face was calm and not unhandsome. Who the devil are you? demanded Conan, staring up at him, knife in hand. I am the master of Yimsham. His voice was like the chime of a temple bell, but a note of cruel mirth ran through it. Where is Yasmina? demanded Karim Shah. The master laughed down at him. What is that to you, dead man? Have you so quickly forgotten my strength once lent to you, that you come armed against me, you poor fool? I think I will take your heart, Karim Shah. He held out his hand as if to receive something, and the Turanian cried out sharply like a man in mortal agony. He reeled drunkenly, and then, with a splintering of bones, a rending of flesh and muscle, and a snapping of male links, his breast 
burst outward with a shower of blood, and through the ghastly aperture something red and dripping shot through the air into the master's outstretched hand, as a bit of steel leaps to the magnet. The Turanian slumped to the floor and lay motionless, and the master laughed and hurled the object to fall before Conancy's feet, a still quivering human heart. With a roar and a curse, Conan charged the stair. From Kemsas's girdle he felt strength and deathless hate flow into him to combat the terrible emanation of power that met him on the steps. The air filled with a shimmering steely haze through which he plung like a swimmer, head lowered, left arm bent about his face, knife gripped low in his right hand. His half-blinded eyes, glaring over the crook of his elbow, made out the hated shape of the seer before and above him, the outline wavering as a reflection wavers in disturbed water. He was wrecked and torn by forces beyond his comprehension, but he felt a driving power outside and beyond his own lifting him inexorably upward and onward, despite the wizard's strength and his own agony. Now he had reached the head of the stairs and the master's face floated in the steely haze before him and a strange fear shadowed the inscrutable eyes. Conan waded through the mist as through a surf, and his knife lunged upward like a live thing. The keen point ripped the master's his robe as he sprang back with a low cry. Then, before Conan's gaze, the wizard vanished, simply disappeared like a burst bubble, and something long and undulating darted up one of the smaller stairs that led up to the left and right from the landing. Conan charged after it, up the left-hand stair, uncertain as to just what he had seen whip up those steps. But in a berserk mood that drowned the nausea and horror whispering at the back of his consciousness. He plunged out into a broad corridor whose uncarpeted floor and untapestried walls were of polished jade and something long and swift whisked down the corridor ahead of him and into a curtain door. From within the chamber rose a scream of urgent terror. The sound lent wings to Conan's flying feet and he hurtled through the curtains and headlong into the chamber within. A frightful scene met his glare. Yasmina covered on the farther edge of a velvet-covered daze, screaming her loathing and horror, an arm lifted as if to ward off attack while before her swayed the hideous head of a giant serpent, shining neck arching up from dark gleaming coils. With a choked cry, Conan threw his knife. Instantly the monster whirled and was upon him like the rush of wind through tall grass. The long knife quivered in its neck, point and a foot of blade showing on one side, and a hilt and a hand's breath of steel on the other, but it only seemed to madden the giant reptile. The great head towered above the man who faced it, and then darted down, the venom dripping jaws gaping wide. But Conan had plucked a dagger from his girdle, and he stepped upward as the head dipped down. The point tore through the lower jaw and transfixed the upper, pinning them together. The next instant the great trunk had loped itself about the Cimmerian as the snake, unable to use its fangs, employed its remaining form of attack. Conance's left arm was pinioned among the bone-crushing folds, but his right was free. Bracing his feet to keep upright, he stretched forth his hand, gripped the hilt of the long knife, 
jutting from the serpent's neck and tore it free in a shower of blood. As if divining his purpose with more than bestial intelligence, the snake writhed and knotted, seeking to cast its loops about his right arm. But with the speed of light, the long knife rose and fell, shearing halfway through the reptile's his giant trunk. Before he could strike again, the great pliant loops fell from him, and the monster dragged itself across the floor, gushing blood from its ghastly wounds. Conan sprang after it, knife lifted, but his vicious swipe cut empty air as the serpent writhed away from him and struck its blunt nose against a panelled screen of sandalwood. One of the panels gave inward and the long bleeding barrel whipped through it and was gone. Conan instantly attacked the screen. A few blows rent it apart and he glared into the dim alcove beyond. No horrific shape coiled there. There was blood on the marble floor and bloody tracks led to a cryptic arched door. Those tracks were of a man's bare feet. Conan! He wailed back into the chamber just in time to catch the Devi of Ventia in his arms as she rushed across the room and threw herself upon him, catching him about the neck with a frantic clasp, half hysterical with terror and gratitude and relief. His wild blood had been stirred to its uttermost by all that had passed. He caught her to him in a grasp that would have made her wince at another time, and crushed her lips with his. She made no resistance. The Devi was drowned in the elemental woman. She closed her eyes and drank in his fierce, hot, lawless kisses with all the abandon of passionate thirst. She was panting with his violence when he ceased for breath and glared down at her lying limp in his mighty arms. I knew you'd come for me she murmured. You would not leave me in this den of devils. At her words, recollection of that environment came to him suddenly. He lifted his head and listened intently. Silence reigned over the castle of Yimsha, but it was a silence impregnated with menace. Peril crouched in every corner, leered invisibly from every hanging. We better go while we can, he muttered. Those cuts were enough to kill any common beast or man, but a wizard has a dozen lives. Wound one and he rides away like a crippled snake to soak up fresh venom from some source of sorcery. He picked up the girl and carrying her in his arms like a child, he strode out into the gleaming jade corridor and down the stairs, nerves tauntly alert for any sign or sound. I met the master, she whispered, clinging to him and shuddering. He worked his spells on me to break my will. The most awful thing was a mouldering corpse which seized me in its arms. I fainted then and lay as one dead. I do not know how long. Shortly after I regained consciousness, I heard sounds of strife below and cries, and then that snake came slithering through the curtains. Ah! She shook at the memory of that horror. I knew somehow that it was not an illusion, but a real serpent that sought my life. It was not a shadow at least answered Conan cryptically. He knew he was beaten and chose to slay you rather than let you be rescued. What do you mean he? she asked uneasily and then shrank against him, crying out and forgetting her question. She had seen the corpse at the foot of the stairs. Those of the seers were not good to look at. 
As they lay twisted and contorted, their hands and feet were exposed to view, and at the sight Yasmina went livid and hid her face against Conance's powerful shoulder. Chapter 10 Yasmina and Conan Conan passed through the hall quickly enough, traversed the outer chamber and approached the door that led upon the gallery. Then he saw the floor sprinkled with tiny glittering shards. The crystal sheet that had covered the doorway had been shivered to bits, and he remembered the crash that had accompanied the shattering of the crystal globe. He believed that every piece of crystal in the castle had broken at that instant, and some dim instinct or memory of esoteric lore vaguely suggested the truth of the monstrous connection between the laws of the Black Circle and the Golden Pomegranates. He felt the short hair bristle chilly at the back of his neck and put the matter hastily out of his mind. He breathed a deep sigh of relief as he stepped out upon the green jade gallery. There was still the gorge to cross, but at least he could see the white peaks glistening in the sun and the long slopes falling away into the distant blue hazes. The Irakzai lay where he had fallen, an ugly blotch on the glassy smoothness. As Conan strode down the winding path, he was surprised to know the position of the sun. It had not yet passed its zenith, and yet it seemed to him that hours had passed since he plunged into the castle of the Black Seers. He felt an urge to hasten, not a mere blind panic, but an instinct of peril growing behind his back. He said nothing to Yasmina, and she seemed content to nestle her dark head against his arching breast and find security in the clasp of his iron arms. He paused an instant on the brink of the chasm, frowning down. The haze which danced in the gorge was no longer rose-hued and sparkling. It was smoky, dim, ghostly, like the life tide that flickered thinly in a wounded man. The thought came vaguely to Conan that the spells of magicians were more closely bound to their personal beings than were the actions of common men to the actors. But far below, the floor shone like tarnished silver and the gold thread sparkled undimmed. Conan shifted Yasmina across his shoulder, where she lay docilely, and began the descent. Hurriedly he descended the ramp, and hurriedly he fled across the echoing floor. He had a conviction that they were racing with time, that their chances of survival depended upon crossing that gorge of horrors before the wounded master of the castle should regain enough power to lose some other doom upon them. When he toiled up the farther ramp and came upon the crest, he breathed a gusty sigh of relief and stood Yasmina upon her feet. You walk from here. He told her, it's downhill all the way. She stole a glance at the gleaming pyramid across the chasm. It reared up against the snowy slope like the citadel of silence and immemorial evil. Are you a magician that you have conquered the black seers of Yimsha, Conan of Gore? She asked as they went down the path with his heavy arm about her supple waist. It was a girdle Kemsa gave me before he died, Conan answered. Yes, I found him on the trail. It is a curious one, which I'll show you when I have time. Against some spells it was weak, but against others it was strong, and a good knife is always a hearty incantation. But if the girdle aided you in conquering the master, she argued, why did it not aid Kemsa? He shook his head. Who knows? 
but Kemsa had been the master's slave. Perhaps that weakened its magic. He had no hold on me as he held on Kemsa. Yet I can't say that I conquered him. He retreated, but I have a feeling that we haven't seen the last of him. I want to put as many miles between us and his lair as we can. He was further relieved to find horses tethered among the tamarisks as he had left them. He loosed them swiftly and mounted the black stallion, swinging the girl up before him. The others followed, freshened by their rest. And what now? she asked. To Afghulistan? Not just now. He grinned hardly. Somebody, maybe the governor, killed my seven headmen. My idiotic followers think I had something to do with it. And unless I'm able to convince them otherwise, they'll hunt me like a wounded jackal. Then what of me? If the headmen are dead, I am useless to you as a hostage. Will you slave me to avenge them? He looked down at her with eyes fiercely aglow and laughed at the suggestion. Then let us ride to the border, she said. You'll be safe from the Afghulis there. Yes, on a Ventian gibbet. I am the queen of Ventia, she reminded him with a touch of her old imperiousness. You have saved my life. You shall be rewarded. She did not intend it as it sounded, but he growled in his throat, ill-pleased. Keep your bounty for your city-bred dogs, princess. If you're a queen of the plains, I'm a chief of the hills, and not one foot toward the border will I take you. But you will be safe, she began bewilderedly. And you would be the devi again. He broke in, no girl, I prefer you as you are now, a woman of flesh and blood riding on my saddle bow. But you can't keep me, she cried, you can't watch and see, he advised grimly. But I will pay you a vast ransom, devil take your ransom, he answered roughly, his arms hardening about her supple figure. The kingdom of Ventia could give me nothing I desire half so much as I desire you. I took you at the risk of my neck. If your courtiers want you back, let them come up to Jaibar and fight for you. But you have no followers now, she protested. You are hunted. How can you preserve your own life, much less mine? I still have friends in the hills, he answered. There is a chief of the Kuraksai who will keep you safely while I bicker with the Afghulis. If they will have none of me by Krum, I will ride northward with you to the steppes of the Kozaki. I was a hetman among the free companions before I rode southward. I'll make you a queen on the Zaporoska river. But I cannot she objected. You must not hold me. If the idea is so repulsive, he demanded, why did you yield your lips to me so willingly? Even a queen is human, she answered, coloring. But because I am a queen, I must consider my kingdom. Do not carry me away into some foreign country. Come back to Ventia with me. Would you make me your king? he asked sardonically. Well, there are customs, she stammered, and he interrupted her with a hard laugh. Yes, civilized customs that won't let you do as you wish. You'll marry some withered old king of the plains, and I can go my way with only the memory of a few kisses snatched from your lips. Ha! Huh. But I must return to my kingdom. She repeated helplessly. Why? He demanded angrily. To chafe your rump on gold thrones and listen to the plaudits of smirking, velvet-skirted fools. Where is the gain? Listen, I was born in the Cimmerian hills where the people are all barbarians. 
I have been a mercenary soldier, a corsair, a cossack, and a hundred other things. What king has roamed the countries, fought the battles, loved the women, and won the plunder that I have? I came into Ghulistan to raise a horde and plunder the kingdoms to the south, your own among them. Being chief of the Afghulis was only a start. If I can conciliate them, I'll have a dozen tribes following me within a year. But if I can't, I'll ride back to the steppes and loot the Turanian borders with the Kozaki, and you'll go with me. To the devil with your kingdom. They fended for themselves before you were born. She lay in his arms looking up at him and she felt a tug at her spirit, a lawless, reckless urge that matched his own and was bite called into being. But a thousand generations of sovereign ship rode heavy upon her. I can't, I can't, she repeated helplessly. You haven't any choice, he assured her. You, what the devil? They had left Yimsha some miles behind them and were riding along a high ridge that separated two deep valleys. They had just stopped a steep crest where they could gaze down into the valley on their right hand, and there was a running fight in progress. A strong wind was blowing away from them, carrying the sounds from their ears, but even so the clashing of steel and thunder of hoofs welled up from far below. They saw the glint of the sun on land's tip and spired helmet. Three thousand mailed horsemen were driving before them a ragged band of turbaned riders, who fled snarling and striking like fleeing wolves. Turanians muttered Conan, squadrons from Secunderum, what the devil are they doing here? Who are the men they pursue? asked Yasmina, and why do they fall back so stubbornly? They cannot stand against such odds. Five hundred of my mad of ghoulies, he growled, scowling down into the veil. They are in a trap, and they know it. The valley was indeed a cul de sac at the end. It narrowed to a high walled gorge, opening out further into a round bowl, completely rimmed with lofty, unscalable walls. The turbaned riders were being forced into this gorge because there was nowhere else for them to go, and they went reluctantly in a shower of arrows and a whirl of swords. The helmeted riders harried them, but did not press in too rashly. They knew the desperate fury of the hill tribes, and they knew too that they had their prey in a trap from which there was no escape. They had recognized the hill men as of coolies, and they wished to hem them in and force a surrender. They needed hostages for the purpose they had in mind. Their emir was a man of decision and initiative. When he reached the Kurashah valley and found neither guise nor emissary waiting for him, he pushed on, trusting to his own knowledge of the country. All the way from Secunderum there had been fighting, and tribesmen were licking their wounds in many a crag-perched village. He knew there was a good chance that neither he nor any of his helmeted spearmen would ever ride through the gates of Secunderum again, for the tribes would all be up behind him now, but he was determined to carry out his orders, which were to take Yasmina Devi from the Afghulis at all costs, and to bring her captive to Secunderum or, if confronted by impossibility, to strike off her head before he himself died. Of all this, of course, the watchers on the ridge were not aware, but Conan fidgeted with nervousness. Why the devil did they get themselves trapped? he demanded of the universe at large. I know what they are doing in these parts. They were hunting me, the dogs. 
poking into every valley and found themselves penned in before they knew it. The poor fools, they are making a stand in the gorge, but they can't hold out for long. When the Turanians have pushed them back into the bowl, they'll slaughter them at their leisure. The din welling up from below increased in volume and intensity. In the strait of the narrow gut, the Avkulis, fighting desperately, were for the time holding their own against the male riders, who could not throw their whole weight against them. Conan scowled darkly, moved restlessly, fingering his hilt, and finally spoke bluntly. Devi, I must go down to them. I'll find a place for you to hide until I come back to you. You spoke of your kingdom. Well, I don't pretend to look on those hairy devils as my children. But, after all, such as they are, they are my henchmen. A chief should never desert his followers, even if they desert him first. They think they were right in kicking me out. Hell, I won't be cast off. I'm still chief of the Avgulis, and I'll prove it. I can climb down on foot into the gorge. But what of me? She queried. You carried me away forcibly from my people. Now will you leave me to die in the hills alone while you go down and sacrifice yourself uselessly? His veins swelled with the conflict of his emotions. That's right, he muttered helplessly. Crumb knows what I can do. She turned her head slightly, a curious expression dawning on her beautiful face. Then, listen, she cried, listen. A distant fanfare of trumpets was borne faintly to their ears. They stared into the deep valley on the left and caught a glint of steel on the farther side. A long line of lenses and polished helmets moved along the veil, gleaming in the sunlight. The riders of Ventia! She cried exultingly. There are thousands of them, muttered Conan. It has been long since a Kshatriya host has ridden this far into the hills. They are searching for me, she exclaimed. Give me your horse, I will ride to my warriors. The ridge is not so precipitous on the left, and I can reach the valley floor. I will lead my horsemen into the valley at the upper end and fall upon the Turanians. We will crush them in the vise. Quick, Conan, will you sacrifice your men to your own desire? The burning hunger of the steppes and the wintry forests glared out of his eyes, but he shook his head and swung off the stallion placing the reins in her hands. You win, he grunted, ride like the devil. She wheeled away down the left-hand slope and he ran swiftly along the ridge until he reached the long ragged cleft that was the defile in which the fight raged. Down the rugged wall he scrambled like an ape clinging to projections and crevices to fall at last, feet first, into the melee that raged in the mouth of the gorge. Blades were wickering and clanging about him, horses rearing and stamping, helmet plumes nodding among turbans that were stained crimson. As he hit, he yelled like a wolf caught a gold-worked rein and dodging the sweep of a scimitar, draw his long knife upward through the rider's vitals. In another instant he was in the saddle, yelling ferocious orders to the Afkulis. They stared at him stupidly for an instant. Then, as they saw the havoc his steel was wreaking among their enemies, they fell to their work again, accepting him without comment. In that inferno of licking blades and spurting blood, there was no time to ask or answer questions. The riders in their spired helmets and gold-worked hauberks swarmed about the gorge mouth, thrusting and slashing, and a narrow defile was 
packed and jammed with horses and men. The warriors crushed breast to breast, stabbing with shortened blades, slashing murderously when there was an instant's room to swing a sword. When a man went down, he did not get up from beneath the stamping, swirling hoofs. Weight and sheer strength counted heavily there, and the chief of the Afghulis did the work of ten. At such times, accustomed habits sway men strongly, and the warriors, who were used to seeing Conan in their vanguard, were heartened mightily, despite their distrust of him. But superior numbers counted too. The pressure of the men behind forced the horsemen of Turan deeper and deeper into the gorge, in the teeth of the flickering tulwars. Foot by foot the Afghulis were shoved back, leaving the defiled floor carpeted with dead, on which the riders trampled. As he hacked and smote like a man possessed, Conan had time for some chilling doubts. Would Yasmina keep her word? She had but to join her warriors, turn southward and leave him and his band to perish. But at last, after what seemed centuries of desperate battling in the valley outside, there rose another sound above the clash of steels and yells of slaughter. And then, with a burst of trumpets that shook the walls and rushing thunder of hoofs, five thousand riders of Ventia smote the hosts of Secundarum. That stroke split the Turanian squadrons asunder, shattered, tore and rent them, and scattered their fragments all over the valley. In an instant, the surge had ebbed back out of the gorge. There was a chaotic, confused swirl of fighting, horsemen wheeling and smiting singly and in clusters. And then the emir went down with a kshatriya of lance through his breast, and the riders, in their spired helmets, turned their horses down the valley, spurring like mad and seeking to slash a way through the swarms which had come upon them from the rear. As they scattered in flight, the conquerors scattered in pursuit, and all across the valley floor and up on the slopes near the mouth and over the crests streamed the fugitives and the pursuers. The Afghulis, those left to ride, rushed out of the gorge and joined in the herring of their foes, accepting the unexpected alliance as unquestioningly as they had accepted the return of their repudiated chief. The sun was sinking toward the distant crags when Conan, his garments hacked to tatters and the mail under them reeking and clotted with blood, his knife dripping and crusted to the hilt, strode over the corpses to where Yasmina Devi set her horse among her nobles on the crest of the ridge near a lofty precipice. You kept your word, Devi, he roared. By crumb though, I had some bad seconds down in that gorge. Look out! Down from the sky swooped a vulture of tremendous size with a thunder of wings that knocked men sprawling from their horses. The scimitar-like beak was slashing for the devil's soft neck, but Conan was quicker. A short run, a tigerish leap, the savage thrust of a dripping knife, and the vulture voiced a horribly human cry pitched sideways and went tumbling down the cliffs to the rocks and river a thousand feet below. As it dropped, its black wings thrashing the air, it took on the semblance not of a bird but of a black-robed human body that fell, arms in wide black sleeves thrown abroad. Conan turned to Yasmina, his red knife still in his hand, his blue eyes smoldering, blood oozing from wounds on his thickly muscled arms and thighs. You are the Devi again, he said, grinning fiercely at the gold-clasped gossamer robe she had donned over her hill-girl attire, 
and awed not at all by the imposing array of chivalry about him. I have you to thank for the lives of some 350 of my rogues, who are at least convinced that I didn't betray them. You have put my hands on the reign of conquest again. I still owe you my ransom, she said, her dark eyes glowing as they swept over him. Ten thousand pieces of gold I will pay you. He made a savage, impatient gesture, shook the blood from his knife and thrust it back in its scabbard, wiping his hand on his mail. I will collect your ransom in my own way, at my own time, he said. I will collect it in your palace at Ayodhya, and I will come with fifty thousand men to see that the scales are fair. She laughed, gathering her reins into her hands, and I will meet you on the shores of the Jumda with a hundred thousand. His eyes shone with fierce appreciation and admiration, and, stepping back, he lifted his hand with a gesture that was like the assumption of kingship, indicating that her road was clear before her.